think for many of us, there are echoes of what it's like to whenever we came to uh, the journey of loving people with HIV, living with HIV, caring about people with HIV, there is some overlap. And again, as I keep reading about what do we do in this time, what I keep reading is what I already knew, which is um, I am sure that what we need to do is care for one another. And so the idea of being stronger together, of taking care of ourselves, is I think an excellent idea. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, shout out to Georgia AETC again and to Thrive SS. So, uh, let me go ahead and introduce panelists. This is also important because as we go through our, our after program, we're not gonna be able to unmute. There are a lot of people on the call. We're not gonna be able to unmute, uh, but we're going to have a chance to ask questions through the question and answer box. If you look, on your screen, you'll see a place to answer, to ask uh, questions that we'll answer at the end of the program. Uh, if you'll direct those to Dr. Chan or Jim or Larry, uh, the folks at Morehouse will be screening those calls and we'll have a chance to uh, uh, talk about your answers, uh, hopefully no later than four o'clock. So uh, again, let me talk who's here. Austin Chan is the uh, principal investigator for the Georgia AATC. He's a physician based in Atlanta. He's an assistant professor of medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. He's uh, trained at Emory with uh, an MD in internal medicine uh, 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 fellowship at Duke University. He's infectious disease trained at Duke University. His clinical practice includes work at Clayton County Board of Health, uh, South Suburban Atlanta, for those of you who don't know the city, as well as uh, in, 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 in inpatient rounds at uh, Grady Memorial Hospital, the large Public Hospital. Uh, Larry Scott Walker, uh, the pride and joy of Baltimore, Maryland. Wave if you're from Maryland. Uh, pride and joy of Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. Artist and activist uh, came to this work many years ago uh, and, and shares a passion for advocacy work. He uh, started a first uh, gay student alliance at Morehouse School of Medicine, so, uh, at Morehouse College some time ago, and uh, came to uh, a number of nonprofits in Atlanta following his graduation from Morehouse uh, in 2015, after serving in many uh, different agencies around town, uh, Larry uh, began Thrive Support Services. Uh, those of us around uh, know that as Thrive SS, currently the largest network of black gay men living with HIV in the country. I suspect many of us know Thrive SS. And again, my name is Jim, a uh, consultant and trainer based in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be working with my friends at Morehouse. Uh, the next slide, uh, a special thanks to our HIV community partners at Thera Technologies. Uh, it, it is through their kind support and encouragement and their wisdom uh, that this all came together. It was, it was a, a brainchild between Morehouse and our friends at Thera to think about how we help people on the front line in the HIV community and the idea of uh, uh, coming together for this is shared by the two of them. Uh, this slide just says this is challenging. I talked a bit about our history for some of us, how our history relates. The other thing I've been saying lately is I think there's a kind of communal trauma that we're all experiencing. Uh, the analogy I've been using is it's as if the uh, uh, tsunami warning has been sounded, but the sky still is blue and the waves still seem calm, but there is something Again, for our friends in New York City, I think the waves are crashing. I think for most of the rest of us, we know uh, there's something ahead. I guess my friends in New Orleans probably ahead of the curve, but for many of us, there's something coming and we're not sure. Uh, anxiety, sadness, uncertainty, all uh, aspects of waiting for the next shoe to drop. Um, uh, most of us have been touched, probably will be touched. Um, it's our belief as we pull this together, the message we want to give is in time this will pass and that we'll get through this together. Uh, key questions we want us all to think about, we invite you to share your ideas as we move forward. Uh, what do we need to know to get through this? And uh, perhaps most importantly, how do we help one another? Uh, again, as I think about how we survive a plague, 
again, those of us working in the field know that the only way uh, people with HIV and uh, those of us who care for people with HIV can survive is by banding together. So uh, this is a quick overview of what we want to do. We're going to do this pretty quickly because we, we want people to have a chance to have their uh, questions answered. And again, in the chat box, our, our friends at Morehouse will be fielding those for you. We'll be uh, giving you a chance to ask those virtually. Um, so we want to talk about sort of what, what COVID is. There's, there's a lot of really good medical information. There's myth, there's misinformation. And, and we asked Dr. Chan, one of the smartest guys in Atlanta, to, to step and really uh, tell us what we know about COVID-19, uh, how it affects people uh, living with HIV, and uh, what to do preventively and if anybody has an exposure. Um, we're also going to talk about recommendations from the Department of Health and Human Services, sort of here's what people with HIV should do preventively, and if you are living with HIV or care about people living with HIV, what to do if you are not feeling well. Uh, we want to touch on the psychosocial issues, particularly isolation, the emotion of, of being uh, physically uh, separated from people, uh, how that might trigger some other memory for people and, and issues of stigma is one of the things I've been thinking about lately. Uh, Larry's going to come up at the end and talk about stimulus bill assistance, sexual health, and resources. So uh, I'd say don't stay for Larry's talk unless you like money or sex. If you are someone who doesn't care about money or sex, there's no need to stay for the last part of this. If um, you are someone who's curious about sex and money, I'd strongly encourage you to listen to what Larry has to say. Again, stimulus bill assistance, uh, how to be sexual in the age that we're living in and resources for people who are living with HIV. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over again. We won't be doing questions and answers until the end. And so I'm going to go ahead and invite those as those come up to go ahead and give those in the chat box in real time. Our partners at Emory are culling those and uh, we'll be having a chance to have more of a conversation in about an hour. So with that, Dr. Austin Chan steps up and talks about the pharmacology uh, uh, and the science behind uh, COVID-19, Dr. Chan. Jim, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and so my my goal here is really just to provide kind of a cursory overview, you know, kind of just to beat back some of the myths that we've been seeing in the media and really just to, you know, deliver kind of an, a quick overview. Um, and my, my section should be about 15 minutes. Um, certainly Jim and Larry are going to be the bulk of this presentation. So, First things first, you know, nomenclature is important. Um, as we saw with HIV, you know, it kind of went through a lot of different names and, you know, started out as GRID, um, evolved to HIV, you know, AIDS, of course, being the illness, HIV being the virus. Um, same thing applies for this particular pandemic. So in this case, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus itself. Um, that's kind of a mouthful. Um, COVID-19 is the disease that it causes. And so in general, uh, most of my colleagues have been referring to it as COVID-19. Um, colloquially, you know, if you want to call it Corona, I've heard it also called Rona for short, um, you know, that's fine. But uh, in, in, in a medical setting, you know, generally COVID-19 is the accepted nomenclature. Um, I would stress, you know, that it's very important to avoid uh, referring to the virus by any name that may be stigmatizing to a specific geography or ethnicity. Again, our goal here is to prevent stigma and racism. Um, certainly in areas that are heavier hit by the virus, especially in the United States, you know, we have seen a spike um, in hate crimes against those specific ethnic groups. So just urge you guys to exercise caution there. Uh, next slide, please. So um, coronaviruses in general are a very frequent cause of the common cold. Um, you know, there's probably like six or seven circulating at any given time that kind of go by just letter and number designations like E11, uh, you know, V54, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but it is in the same family as some other notable viruses, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, very non-contagious, but had a very high mortality. Um, in addition, some people may recall the original uh, SARS um, outbreak that occurred in China 2002-2003. Again, not very contagious, um, but very high mortality. So that was SARS-CoV-1. 
This is SARS-CoV-2, um, a very uh, cousin to that original virus. So I've heard there's been a lot of comparisons to the flu, um, and I just want to go ahead and you know kind of dispel those myths. Certainly, the seasonal flu can be very deadly, and we do see some you know specific flus that are more deadly than others. You know, H1N1, um, the avian flu, but the, you know the reality is um, this is very different. It is more contagious, and it also has an overall higher mortality rate. Um, certainly, you know we do see healthy people um, having severe influenza illness, but again, we're seeing much higher rates here, and that's why we're kind of you know, pushing for flattening the curve and trying not to keep our hospital systems from being overwhelmed. Um, of course, there's also, you know, the flu vaccine, which is a great way to mitigate disease um, and no such um, vaccine exists for COVID-19. So I think it's important to, um, you know, really plan for this thing to be going on for a long time. Um, you know, our restrictions uh, will be kind of varying, you know, on a state by state basis and could change based on the medical breakthroughs and testing breakthroughs. Um, but, you know, this, this thing may be around for a long time and we should plan accordingly. Next slide. So talking about transmission, um, essentially person to person transmission occurs through respiratory droplets. Um, these are generated through coughs, sneezes, even just standard breathing. Um, and so when these droplets encounter the mucous membranes on another person, the eyes, nose, and mouth, um, that's how it kind of enters into the system. So in the hospital, um, we're expected to have a mask, goggles, and then contact precautions, which is a gown and gloves. Um, in general, you know, really try to avoid touching your face. Um, if you are wearing gloves in public, but then you and you touch a bunch of surfaces and then touch your eye, you know, to scratch your eye, that's not really doing you any favors. Um, and so, some people, you know, I would I would certainly caution against the false um, protection of wearing gloves if you're still touching your face. Um, and so what happens is this virus first cause, can cause a lot of hypoxia. Um, we do see some you know, lung scarring on, on lung imaging. And so it reduces your body's ability to absorb oxygen from the air. But in addition to that, um, and of course you can require ventilatory, ventilatory support for that. Um, in some cases you do get a very severe second stage where you could have heart damage. Um, you may have very, very low blood pressures and these things can all result in multi-organ failure and overall shock, um, and that stage, unfortunately, has a very, very high mortality. So that's kind of the scary part of it. All right, next slide. So this is a nice little uh, graphic that's been circulated around. Um, I think it's really important to kind of tell the difference between, you know, COVID-19 and allergies. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I think if you're having flu symptoms or common cold symptoms, you know, go ahead and see if you qualify for testing. Um, speaking specifically in Georgia, you know, most of our testing sites are symptom triggered. You know, unfortunately, we just haven't been able to roll out like test everybody kind of places yet. Um, if that's the case in your specific area, you know, if you have common cold or flu symptoms, I would go ahead and call the uh, call that hotline, see if you qualify for testing. Now, the, the trickiest one here, of course, is seasonal allergies. And uh, I can tell you that it's it's allergy season here in Georgia. Um, I get allergies really bad. You know, there were a couple of times where I forgot my Zyrtec and I got home from the hospital and I was like, oh my God, is this cough from COVID? Is this from allergies? What's going on? Um, so first thing first, you know, make sure you're staying compliant with your medications, allergy meds, HIV meds, you know, blood pressure meds, um, stay compliant with those. I think I just gonna, I'm just going to have to ask you to, to know your body. You know, if you think um, that these are your allergy symptoms, this runny nose, it's related to the cough, you know, that's okay. You know, we all know the runny nose can cause um, a little bit of a dry cough. That's well described, but if you're getting the fever, you know, you're getting the shortness of breath, um, especially these myalgias or a shaking chill, you know, I would, I would err on the side of caution and go get tested in that setting, or at least call the hotline, tell them what you got and go get tested. Um, you know, certainly um, the fever definition standard in the hospitals, like 101.5, um, you know, if you have two fever points over say 100.4, 100.6, probably half hour apart, um, you know, I would go ahead and consider that to be a true fever. I know it's been hard to get thermometers, but, you know, fever can really be a helpful distinguisher in this setting. Next slide. And so we definitely need to take these social distancing precautions very seriously. You know, it's really important that we, you know, flatten the curve. We preserve um, 
healthcare resources as much as we can as a society. Uh, what we're seeing is that you know healthy people and people who are under the age of 55 can definitely be affected and definitely have um, very serious complications from this disease. You know, at Grady, um, since I'm on service, we had three we had three patients in the ICU who were between the ages of 30 and uh, 39. And, you know, that was particularly scary, I'm um, 35 myself. And so, you know, to see these people really battling um, COVID-19 with serious complications is very challenging. Um, and so we also know that um, comorbidities um, affect mortality rates regardless of age. So heart disease, diabetes, asthma, or COPD, um, any other, you know, pulmonary fibrosis or other lung disease, these things can dramatically increase your mortality. And what we see is they're also additive. So as you increase the number of risk factors you have, including age, um, your mortality goes through the roof. And I, I would urge you to take extreme caution. Um, certainly patients with cancer and other immunologic conditions, um, including uh, organ transplant recipients, need to exercise extreme, extreme caution and extreme social distancing. So speaking with patients with HIV, you know, there's a small cohort in Wuhan, um, just generally describing the idea that lower CD4 is associated with higher mortality. That appears to be um, the expert opinion as well. Um, again, also patients with uncontrolled viral loads um, most likely have higher uh, mortality rates as well. So that kind of be that's kind of based on expert opinion. Um, and in general, you know, as our HIV population gets older, we also see a lot of these, you know, concomitant diseases of aging, such as heart disease, diabetes. Um, you know, throw in HIV on top of that, and you know, that creates patients who are very much at risk. Um, so it's it's critical, you know, that we are making sure our patients have access to meds, making sure their ADAPs are up to date. Um, you know, that's certainly been a struggle for us um, down at Clayton. Next slide. So the general precautions that um, have been foot put forth in terms of you know preventing spread of disease, flattening the curve. Um, number one, hand washing. Social dis number two, social distancing, self isolation, and of course, you know, each state is kind of gauging uh, individually um, how to gauge the lockdown or shelter in place orders. So those are all very, you know, this is an international pandemic, but we're very much dealing with this on um, on a local level. You know, I think that each each state and even each city um, is responsible for you know it, determining its own level of uh, social distancing and physical distancing. You know, for better or worse. Um, next slide, please. So social distancing, you know, physical distancing is what they may be changing it to you. Um, in general, this is the idea that you want to be standing farther than the average droplet transmission. Um, so six feet is generally the accepted amount. Um, I do apologize. Someone's honking their horn outside my window. Hopefully that's not interrupting the audio feed too much. Um, so you may be seeing at, you know, grocery stores, um, essential um, facilities, they have these kind of like things on the ground that are presumably measured to be six feet apart. Um, so the goal there is that if somebody coughs or, you know, generates respiratory droplets, that it doesn't really reach that full six feet, doesn't reach, you know, the mucous membranes of somebody standing six feet away. Um, and that's generally accepted to be an appropriate distance. Um, also, you know, limiting face-to-face -face interaction, you know, please don't be talking to somebody um, who you don't normally see, you don't normally interact with in a close basis. That obviously is a high exchange of aerosols. And, you know, We've we've put all these shelter in place, you know, closed all these facilities to limit the number of people gathering in crowds, because um, you can imagine that is likely just um, a high infection rate, high spreading event. Next slide. So hand washing, you know, this is something that I have to do a lot as an infectious diseases doctor, um, something that I was really bad at in medical school, actually. Uh, so, you know, in medical school, we, we have this little project where we had this demonstration where we put like this um, invisible uh, powder on our hands, but it was it was fluorescent. It would fluoresce under a black light, and we could see how well we washed our hands. And the areas that people most often neglected um, were the fingertips and between the fingers. Uh, most people kind of like rub their palms together, you know, and the back of their hands in general. But miss those two critical areas. Um, so what I would say is make sure you're dragging your fingers across the palm of your hands. Make sure you're rubbing um, in between your fingers as well. In general, make sure you're hitting that appropriate duration of 20 seconds. Um, people like to sing different songs. You know, happy birthday is what we're traditionally taught. You could pick literally any song um, for 20 seconds. So, 
And make sure you're cleaning with a dry paper towel. You know, if you're using uh, soiled cloth, you know, obviously that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, and, you know, warm or hot water is, is definitely appropriate. Next slide. So, you know, when do we wash our hands? Um, you know, in general, I think it's, as long as we're being cognizant of it, I think that's probably good enough. Um, after using the restroom, once you touch or clean your pet, um, you know, preparing food, certainly all, all around food preparation, my wife is all over me about that, um, after touching raw meat. And then, of course, you know, specifically when you're coming back, um, if you had to go to an essential outing to pick up groceries or something like that, make sure you have a hand washing station or a hand sanitizing station as soon as you get home, or you just make a beeline, you know, right for the bathroom, uh, wash your hands when you get back. Um, in general, now that CDC's uh, recommending masks, you know, the standard uh, hospital practice is if your mask is considered soiled, then you have to wash your hands after you touch the mask. And so what I would say is to just really try to limit um, touching the mask, you know, now that CDC is recommending cloth masks in public for everybody. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of the standard flattened curve graph that has, has been widely circulated. Um, the idea here is that with control measures, we don't overwhelm our healthcare resources so that everyone who needs a vent can get a vent. Um, in this case, you know, if everybody got sick at the same time, what we've seen is that 5% of people, you know, 5 to 7% of COVID patients end up with severe disease and require a ventilator. And we simply just don't have that capacity um, for, you know, in our hospital system, you know, at Grady, we're pretty much overwhelmed every seasonal flu season. Um, and so, you know, to, with the COVID looking numbers, that would be, that would get really scary really fast. And so our goal is to decrease the, the rate of infection so that we can meet the need of our population. And, you know, we don't have to ration vents or any kind of draconian measures like that. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> these are all the tricky questions, you know, when do I seek care? When do I stay at home? I think you just have to trust your body, trust yourself. Um, if you're feeling short of breath, certainly progressive shortness of breath, um, activities where you, you could have done them before and you're not able to do them anymore. Um, that would definitely be a trigger to go seek, uh, seek care, you know, persistent pain or chest pain, pressure in the chest, um, again, would be another reason to go seek care. Obviously, if somebody you're, you're staying with or you're sheltering with has confusion or isn't waking up, you know, certainly call EMS um, and bluish lips or face, you know, if it gets to that point, um, go to the ER. You know, I think, and the other thing to say is, you know, if you're experiencing symptoms that you don't think are related to COVID, but are related to another disease that you have, um, you know, make sure you're going to the emergency room for those as well. So, you know, just got to trust yourself and it's okay. If you go to the ER and, you know, you know, hopefully you end up testing negative or something, or you didn't have COVID, that is okay. Um, you know, you just got to trust yourself to make the right call. Next slide, please. And so what to do, you know, let's say you have been in close contact, you have a high risk exposure. Um, you know, certainly see if you qualify for testing yourself. You know, most of our testing sites here in Georgia are testing people with high risk exposures. Um, but while you're waiting for test results, you know, main thing is to, you know, ask yourself, are you having symptoms? Are you not? Um, but go ahead and, uh, you know, see, see if you can get a test, of course. Again, this varies widely by county to county, state by state, um, but certainly rely on the hotlines, rely on uh, telehealth to uh, see if you qualify for a test. Next slide, please. Yep, and of course, call your healthcare docs. Um, for advice and please, please self isolate and that'll be on the next slide. So self isolation, um, essentially, if you're waiting for a positive test or you've tested positive, you know, you should really be waiting 14 days after the initiation of symptoms um, before you resume your usual activities. Um, if you're living with other people, it gets incredible. It gets a lot more complicated because you should really avoid, you know, close exposure with them, especially while they're, they're awaiting their test. Um, you know, certainly if you have available, you know, if you can get a cloth mask or something, I would definitely wear that. That would reduce the amount of aerosols you generate. Um, and so it's important to know that you can definitely not have symptoms and still be spreading the virus. And so generally, once you test positive, you do get a lot of guidance 
from the entity that tested you. And I would really uh, stick close, adhere closely to what they say. Or if you have questions, you know, reach out via telehealth visit um, you know, to get that advice. Next slide, please. And so hopefully, you know, you're able to manage your symptoms at home. Um, you test positive, but again, the vast majority of people who do have COVID don't end up requiring hospitalization or having severe disease. So it's just an issue of, you know, staying home, staying in contact with your healthcare provider. But that being said, you know, you can definitely develop progressive symptoms. Um, and if you have worsening fever, worsening shortness of breath, certainly um, go ahead and just call back, you know, maintain constant contact with your healthcare doc and get back re-engaged in care if you need to. And, you know, main thing, especially for HIV patients, you know, continue your HIV meds, continue all the meds that you need to be on, um, you know, positive or not, unless specifically directed, um, you know, by a doctor or other healthcare provider. Next slide. And so that does it for me. Um, I'll pass it over to Jim and Larry. So I'm, I'm a little bit over there, um, but I'll be, I'll be available to take any questions um, at the end. And of course, if you have any specific questions on, you know, clinical trials or any of that stuff, uh, please reach out to Damon or myself. And I'm happy to get more in depth on that. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you, doctor. Again, we're gonna press forward, but I've already seen some questions in the chat box. If there are medical questions for Dr. Chan, go ahead and get those in the box. I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, living in the world from a psychosocial perspective, less a biomedical perspective than Dr. Chan. And again, Larry will come up shortly and talk about resources that are available. And again, only for people who are interested how to have sex and where to obtain money. Again, only for people that are interested. Um, uh, this quote I think was brilliant as, as uh, the, the, the team at Thera and Morehouse pulled the slide deck together, somebody pulled this up. And I, I think that it's super important that there's a question, uh, thank you, Khadija, uh, about uh, pre-existing conditions. And I, I, I don't have data today, but you can't tell me that the things we know about social determinants of health in people who are more vulnerable and that people who don't uh, have the same kind of health outcomes because of health disparities aren't uh, likely uh, to be people who are suffering a disproportionate burden as a result of COVID-19. I don't have hard data. When I think about who's uh, uh, not doing as well with all kinds of other health problems, uh, the impact of health disparities, how people who are socially disenfranchised are having a harder time living with HIV, it strikes me that we probably all need to think about those most vulnerable. And again, part of how we pull together is not just pulling together the people who are close to us, but I think to throw the net wide and say this is going to affect a whole lot of people who are socially disenfranchised for reasons of race and ethnicity and economics and sexual orientation and gender identity and for all the reasons that people are disenfranchised, I think to keep, think about that broad net, uh, to advocate for those who are not able to advocate for themselves and recognize that with our commitment and hard work, maybe as at the end of this tsunami, uh, we won't be in the shape that actually has us being worse as predicted here in the quote by Nicole Arrett. Um, so uh, what are we experiencing? I, I think uh, I, I sort of sum it up in a couple ways. There's a tremendous uh, un uncertainty and anxiety that almost everybody's having. I've, I did a series of webinars the last few days with a lovely aid service organization in Atlanta with whom I've worked a long time. Uh, what I heard when I asked people, how are you, on that everyone is living with uncertainty, anxiety, I think I just want to call out the particular stressors of people that are still on the front line. Um, I know based on what I saw in the early registration that there are people who are on this call who are working from home, who are under a stay at home order. And I also know if I'm looking at the registration that there are still people who are still showing up, who are still interacting with consumers. Um, I think that's extraordinary. It's the best of uh, what healthcare ought to be. And I just want to name that although we're all making our best decisions about safety, those folks who are still seeing clients, uh, there's 
uh, a particular uh, kind of fear, a particular kind of uncertainty that uh, is, is part of living in this new reality. Uh, again, anxiety, irritability, insecurity, it's, it's as if uh, somebody has shaken our world up and we're waiting for things to fall. Um, for, for folks who are super heightened, uh, there can be a sense, of, as as Larry said, of or of, as Austin said, sort of, oh, I sneezed, oh, someone coughed. I, I don't know if other people have had that, but you you're out in public and and someone sneezes or coughs, and you kind of jump back and and act a, a little crazy, <laughs> just thinking what could have happened. Uh, sleep disturbance, helplessness, lack of control. Uh, again, issues related to anxiety. I'm also really um, starting to name this as a sort of anticipatory grief. I, I said it earlier and I'll say it again. I think there's a kind of collective anticipatory grief that's part of what we're experiencing emotionally. And everything I know about grief says the ways around it are to talk about it, to allow ourselves to feel it, and to seek social support to find our way through it. Talk, tears, social support is the way we survive. Grief, and it's strange, there's there's not anything that I can say I'm grieving about, but I, I go through moods through the day and, and sometime yesterday, I was just having a, a bad moment and my partner said, what is it? And I said, I'm having the COVID sads. And that was shorthand for, I don't even know what this is about, but I feel sad that 370,000 people in our country uh, have this thing, uh, uh, not knowing what could happen. Uh, and, and so, so again, if you're feeling any of these things on the webinar yesterday that I talked about, somebody typed privately in the chat box, am I normal? And I think the other part of this is uh, the, the grief and anxiety in the age of COVID-19 are unpredictable, uncertain, not linear. So you may have a good day, have another buddy that says I'm really kind of doing okay? Am I a heartless person? The answer is there's no one way to go through this. I think being kind to ourselves, allowing ourselves to feel what we feel, working through our grief, uh, working through the anxiety. Again, you are not alone uh, trying to reach out. Uh, Dr. Chan touched on something that feels really important. WHO, I understand, is in discussions about moving from uh, social distancing as the term to physical distancing. And, and what I'm finding in my own experience is I'm really missing contact with people. I am very extroverted and I am tired of being in this house doing the things that uh, the two of us and our dog can do. And I think uh, what I've found for myself is even beyond calls and emails and texts, I'm having to see some faces. And so I've gone to FaceTime and Skype with some people. But I think for all of us kind of dealing with being home alone and figuring out how to do it, uh, some important suggestions here as we are distancing. Um, one suggestion that's really important is to get to break the scenery and get up and move around. If you if you are able to do it in a safe place outside, uh, people that I know who are saying, I had a great day, are saying, I got outside. I think there's, even though maybe you have a pretty house, maybe you like, place you live, maybe you like the people you live with, maybe you live alone, but but there's something about fresh air, about uh, getting outside of ourselves, getting outside into the open air that seems to be really helpful to people. Um, uh, again, figuring out how to be at home and self-isolate without feeling low, worried, and sleep disturbance is a challenge that, that uh, there are unique challenges for people who live alone at this time. Uh, I really think one of the ways we get through this is thinking to ourselves, who do we know that's alone? And can I reach out to that person? If you are someone who lives alone, uh, can you reach out and maybe not come over? Although uh, if you aren't in a situation where, where people have been exposed, uh, a friend and I are playing with the idea of, of bringing lunch. Nobody touches nothing, but we bring a sandwich, we sit eight feet apart and we have a visit, one of my neighbors and uh, out on the porch. Uh, and I don't touch that bench for days after he's left, but trying to figure out how to maintain connection. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up as I read about living with COVID-19 is act, staying active and keeping a routine, keeping a schedule. Get up and get at, get in that shower. Uh, uh, get up and get dressed. Get up and put that makeup on. You know, you know who you are. 
uh, I, uh, I, I don't want to call people out, but you know who you are. You've been in them sweatpants three days. Please get out of them sweatpants, uh, put on some makeup, and stay in touch with people. Uh, again, how to stay in touch in the right way, uh, uh, figuring out who, where your family and friends are, trying to main touch email, social, text, phone calls. Again, as I said, for me, I found that text and email wasn't enough. And uh, my partner and I did a, a, a Zoom a dinner with some buddies in Maine uh, the other night. We set the laptop and had a visit, and we did the same thing with some other, another couple here. He got the idea from somebody else, but um, there there was a sense of having, it's weird, but uh, having dinner with somebody and, and at least breaking that. So for me, video apps have been part of the thing. I'm hoping Larry will tell us about some other video apps when we get to the talk about sex in the, just a little preview for Larry when we get to the issue of uh, uh, sex in the age of COVID-19. I'm hoping uh, Skype and uh, whatever I'm talking about is not the only option. And again, leaning on other people is the way that we lower anxiety. Again, as I've uh, looked at this uh, literature on grief, literature on anxiety, social support, get together. Uh, people have got to decide how much n news you're going to take in. Uh, one of the things that I talked about to this uh, uh, community organization was people deciding how much news to take in. Almost everybody said they've eliminated, eliminated or limited news and they're monitoring how much social media they take in. I can't decide for anybody. Y'all are grown people, but what I find is that for myself, if I sit in the chair and let the loop roll, one hour turns into two hours. I'm I'm immobilized by what I'm seeing. Uh, one of the chaps on the call yesterday said he sat down and did news at the end of the day for two hours. Uh, did two hours of whatever cable news, and he said it was miserable, and he he won't do make that mistake again. So so figuring out how much, uh, figuring out what's what's reliable. Obviously, uh, CDC.gov and, and and Mac our our, our friends at at NMAC offer. Uh, good COVID-19 resources. Uh, uh, again, too much time on social media. You, you got to decide for yourself. <clears throat> I'm a Facebook guy. I love to see people's kids' birthday party and see uh, uh, what their COVID baking tips are. I've got a girlfriend in Boston who's baking up a, like a crazy person. And uh, it gets into the political agitating and it gets into uh, surveillance and epidemiology. And, and again, this bottom line, if it's too much for you, turn the darn thing off. If it's too much for you, if it's affecting the quality of your life, turn it off, talk to somebody, get close. Again, keeping some structure exercise is a great thing. Luckily, I got my bike tuned up before this all started. Um, I'm, I'm someone who needs to, who, who typically would go to a, a healthcare, the YMCA here. And so, so I'm really missing that. Um, but but I my bike and, and walking and staying nearby again depending on where you live I realize that that some people uh, who live in super urban areas it may be difficult to to maintain appropriate distance walking within two miles of your house again kind of the safety of being nearby trying to maintain sleep sleep is so essential to our health the downside is when we are anxious or some of us when we're experiencing grief difficulty and sleep disturbance comes up so doing what we can. Um, the literature on sleep hygiene says cut your caffeine back, turn the stimulus off late, uh, less caffeine, stimulus off. Um, uh, find a ritual to ease yourself into sleep. Uh, uh, try to not do any screen time for at least an hour before, like the, the light in any screen is, is still stimulating a part of your brain that makes sleep difficult. So closing screens down, healthy, balanced diet, uh, obviously, it's pretty tough. I'm going to call myself out first. I'm, I'm, I've am i put on what I call the COVID-5. Uh, I suspect I'm not the only one dealing with uh, too much time on my hands and the pantry uh, being open more than I should. And so trying to say I'm going to eat right, only bring in healthy food. I talked to my sister just this morning about how to only bring stuff in the house that's healthy and just not bringing the junk in. For me, when I'm in an emotional space, just kind of the junky Cheetos and M&Ms and whatever else just are an unhealthy way to fill that need, as is alcohol. And I'm going to add other potentially compulsive things, alcohol, recreational substances, shoppers, gamblers, you know who you are. 
sexual compulsivity. Again, stay tuned for what Larry's got to tell us, but I'm guessing having all kinds of sex all the time probably is not going to be on Larry's list of things to do. Uh, uh, again, too much time on your hands, feelings of grief, feelings of anxiety. Oh, I usually have one wine, now I'll have two. Uh, it's a slippery slope with too much time on our hands. Some of us uh, don't have to sober up and look good in the morning, and so it's that much more tempting to say, what the heck. Um, relaxation techniques. Again, when I poll people, what are you doing to stay balanced? What I hear a lot is going outside, talking to friends, yoga, meditation, mindfulness, uh, uh, ways that you relax. I don't, I don't have a cookbook. I can't say here's exactly what to do, but I do think it's super important that you think about the physiology of relaxation, the physiology of deep breathing, and finding your own way. Looking online for healthy things, I've seen so much junk on YouTube and other websites I won't talk about, just junk, and, and can we use that time to read, to find uh, healthy things to study? And the other thing that uh, came up yesterday, people talked about doing artwork, creating, knitting, crocheting, uh, painting, uh, using that part of our brain that's creative. A lot of folks are gardening. I, I actually am kind of taken to my yard a little bit. And so the idea that we can be creative, I think uses a part of our brain that's the opposite of being worried and scared and hopeless. So if you are self-isolating, if you've been exposed, if you've had a known exposure, if you're developing symptoms, now it's time to get serious. And unfortunately, it's time, as Dr. Chan said, for at least 14 days to say, I am not going to have contact at home uh, with a window of possible. If you get to select a place, uh, really severely restricting how much uh, contact you have. Those of you who are CNN watchers know that Chris Cuomo locked himself in the basement. He said, I'm locked in the basement, keeping all my people upstairs. So that level of severity, you know, continuing to check your uh, symptoms while you're there, staying in touch with your healthcare provider. Uh, anytime you're coughing, making sure that you're using good infection control, cough into Kleenex, discarding that, uh, cleaning your hands properly, washing your hands properly. Uh, Dr. Chan suggested happy birthday twice. I like two verses of I will survive. Uh, and so other options, pick your favorite song. Uh, go on now, go walk out the door. Uh, uh, use your towel. Dr. Chan talked about shared towels and cleaning your room every day. Again, unfortunately, if there's a possible exposure or if someone's tested positive, it's time to really, really be careful uh, uh, about the possibility of infection to others. So using, if it's possible, using only the bathroom. Uh, uh, if you have to share it, using the bathroom last. Things to not share there on your list. I think what's difficult is how to go through this kind of restriction and not take on some sort of bad feeling about yourself or stigma or shame. I just want to say, I think what's really important is that we allow people who are living with COVID-19 or who've been exposed and have to self-isolate to understand this is a virus. This is not anything to feel guilty or bad about or to feel shame about. If a buddy um, one of the only people I know who has tested positive, who, who does have COVID-19, thank God, someone who's doing well, but but he got mad at his wife. He said, yeah, she's out there telling the neighbors and now everybody in there thinking I got it. You know, and on the one hand, this guy's a healthcare provider. You think, well, God, COVID-19, you're a healthcare provider. But on the other, just the stigma for this guy of knowing other people knew, um, you know, how do we do these things to keep other people safe, to stay safe and not have it reinforce some old injury, some old feeling that, again, I think about the challenge for people living with HIV. I have an infection, it's potentially fatal. It could harm other people. And being really mindful as we're coaching people and supporting people in self-isolation, that we remember the messages people got when they were first diagnosed with HIV, for those of us who care about people with HIV, what it's like for people to have lived in that stigma. Um, so how to do meals. The best case scenario is to have meals outside, leave everything on the tray again. Um, it's just good practice because of how infectious this agent is for the people that you care about to be super careful when it's collected straight in the dishwasher, hot water, 
uh, washing hands right after that. If there's not a dishwasher, so hot soapy water wearing rubber gloves, let them dry in the air, wash the rubber gloves, take those off and then wash the hands. We have that on a couple different slides, but uh, rubber gloves, wash the gloves, and then wash the hands once the gloves are off. Unfortunately, because of the nature of this thing, people have to be super careful. And again, 14 days, uh, when to stop self-isolating, if you've had symptoms, no fever for five days, and it's been 14 days. 14 days is the magic number uh, when you first develop symptoms or have had contact with a person. Uh, so you're tracking your fever and you're also documenting. And I think uh, what's also part of this is you do this in consultation with your healthcare provider um, that, that if you're not sure, and this is a point to stay as you are self-isolating, making decisions about when to go out. Um, this is a, a, a very important time to stay uh, tuned into your healthcare provider to make sure your healthcare provider uh, understands what you're doing and that you're following uh, your healthcare provider's advice. Now, th this slide is just about how uh, how long uh, COVID-19 hangs out. If it's aerosolized, that is if it's sprayed in the air uh, through a sneeze, um, uh, three hours uh, on copper, uh, on cardboard, and on plastic and steel. This is the reason why people are so concerned about surfaces when you're out in public, why they're wiping down the, um, the carts at your grocery store while we're all being cautious when we're out shopping up to two to three days. It's the reason why the airlines uh, have, have gone crazy with cleaning because not only how uh, infectious, but also how long the virus appears to be able to live on surfaces. Again, I think what's important here, um, these estimates are all the outside estimates, but that's important because certainly if you care about uh, somebody who's COVID-19 positive, if you think you've been exposed, if you've uh, been somewhere where you're near cardboard, near plastic, to think through uh, how, to, how to keep yourself safe is essential. How to clean your home. Again, Dr. Chan talked about this. Good thing most uh, uh, cleaning products clean are, are going to kill coronavirus. So, so you don't have to run around and, and go to the medical supply store. Most, look at this woman with her spray bottle. She's down on that counter. She's going to get that. I just noticed that slide. She's going to get that counter clean. That was, I'm laughing because that was me Saturday. I was, I was like, I just snapped. I was going to clean my house. I cleaned every corner of my house with my rubber gloves, just staring at every little, every little potential coronavirus. I was fitting to kill it. Um, uh, any detergent, disinfectant, countertops, tabletop, doorknobs. I never clean my doorknobs in my life, but think about it. Who's been in your house? Who's been turning them? I did go to a store today, and I, 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 I often do the elbow thing, but I've been really doing the elbow thing on every door that I could. Bathroom fixtures, toilet handles, phones, keyboards, certainly if you're on a shared computer operation, keyboards, tablets. Um, and again, same direction. Clean it with rubber gloves, uh, wash the gloves while you're wearing them, take them off and then wash your hands. Again, good practice, probably things we all should have been doing, uh, ways that we all should have been staying clean, but uh, for uh, all of us. Again, what not to do, don't go to work, don't share your things, don't invite visitors, keep away from older people, anybody with long-term medical condition and women who are pregnant. I think Larry is stepping up. Larry, is it you? I'll do this one then Larry is gonna step up. Ways that we support one another. Uh, again, uh, it's it makes sense that we're all, many of us feeling overwhelmed and struggling. Uh, to acknowledge the feelings, to seek social support, look after our well-being, and uh, remembering to manage. So this one says cigarettes, drink. I add gambling, smoking, Cheetos. Uh, it won't help in the long term. As much as much as that half a bag of Cheetos tastes good every afternoon at four o'clock, in the long run, it will not will not help. And in fact, there are other ways, more functional ways to get support. 
So, um, Larry, I'm going to invite you to step up. I think you take over. Yes. Hello, everyone. Great job, Jim. Thank you so much. I am. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. Awesome. I, I'm Larry Scott Walker. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Thrive Support Services. And as Jim so eloquently uh, put forward earlier, I've been in this space for a very long time. But even more than that, in this time, I'm here to bring that the community voice to this conversation. And as a person living with HIV, but also a person living with chronic asthma. I know that a lot of we have a lot of frustrations and, and, and anxieties that come up as Jim just covered uh, during this time. If you're a person who uh, is experiencing any type of or in need of any type of assistance, there are various programs that have assistance programs right now. On the screen, you see a few of those listed uh, housing, medication, uh, insurance, food service, food services, as well as transportation and peer support networks. Next slide. Again, if you're a person dealing with any type of loss, especially job or housing loss, here are some resources that are available. Um, some are specific for pe two people living with HIV, um, and they're not only pointing to resources that you can that can align you with resources, but also uh, places that can align you with uh, to help you to mitigate and deal with the emotional feelings that may be coming up at this time. So I definitely invite you to engage to this list. Next slide. We've been hearing a lot about the stimulus bill. This is a, a major conversation that's happening with, uh, amongst our members at Thrive and in the community. So here we've pro provided a quick and dirty of the community facing aspects of this, this stimulus bill. There will be checks that are sent to individuals. Most adults will receive up to $1,200 and this does depend on your income. Unemployment benefits have been strengthened an additional $600 per week for upwards of four months. Um, this applies to self-employed people, as well as gig workers, part-time workers, contract workers, as well as people on social security benefits. Um, this also extends coverage up to from 26 weeks to 39 weeks. Um, some rules apply around this. Uh, you may, uh, in some instances, be required to have, you know, uh, filed your taxes in 2018 or 19. So definitely, uh, definitely consult the IRS. The IRS's page, they definitely, they have a Q and A page on the IRS that answers many of these questions. Additionally, student loans, uh, student loans payments have been postponed for upwards of six months without any penalty or interest. Housing protections have been put into order for homeowners. There's a 60 day hold on any mortgage payments for upwards of four months for upwards of four months and 120 day uh, ban on any evictions for renters, which is great. Next slide, please. So this is the main question that comes up at Thrive and our networks is how to remain safe, sexually active and safe during this time, how does one, for instance, socially distance and still hook up? Is it safe to hook up? And then what if a person has, you know, been also, or purports to also have been uh, social distancing as well? Is that then safe? Next slide. The short answer is that sexual health in this, in this time of COVID equals health for everyone involved, yourself, your partner, as well as the people that live in your home. As uh, Dr. Chan covered uh, earlier, COVID can be spread from any person who has it asymptomatic or otherwise. Uh, the virus is spread through direct contact with saliva or mucus, and it can is found and can be spread through contact with fecal matter. Uh, the virus has not yet been found in semen or vaginal fluids. The truth of the matter, and it's hard to, a hard pill to swallow, is that we are our safest sex partners at this time. So as uh, Jim was speaking to earlier, uh, you know, maybe engaging uh, some sites, you know, some sex sites, you know, uh, Pornhub, uh, MyVidster, uh, or in, in, or even investing in an OnlyFans page of some entrepreneur, you know, who's also locked down during this time. And of course, people are going to still want that person to person in interaction, just understanding that, you know, COVID is spread from person to person and, and trying at best to avoid coming in contact with saliva as well as fecal matter. That may limit some of our practices during this time. We may, kissing may have to, you may have to engage a uh, latex barrier, a dental dam for kissing as well as rimming to, to remain safe. 
as Jim covered as well, making sure to wash up before and after sex, understanding that it can live, uh, the, the virus can live on certain surfaces. And as always, as people living with HIV and as people in general, we should be looking to limit the risk of, uh, of uh, and prevent the spread of HIV as well as other sexually transmitted infections. Next slide. Here's some, uh, some guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services for people living with HIV. It is very, very important for people who are living with advanced stage HIV or uh, people who are poorly controlled HIV to take extra precautions to remain safe. I know that we've been hearing, as people living with HIV, we've been hearing a lot about Kalitra. Your medical regimen should not be changed or altered in any type of way to fit Kalitra into your, your regimen. Also consider the risk versus benefit of going to live appointments at this time. Many ASOs or aid service organizations, as well as other medical providers, have gone, gone to a, a more virtual telemedicine approach to keep everyone safe. And for people who have a sustained viral, sustained viral load, a virally suppressed load, and you know, pretty much keep their appointments, have been virally suppressed for a while, maybe even considering putting off or postponing your appointments and your lab appointments. Next slide. Additional guidances uh, from the from the Department of Health and Human Services is to maintain at least 30 days of medication on hand. It's best to have at least 90 days. I know that some of us, are, our medical providers may not allow for that. Our insurances may not allow for that. But considering what's going on right now, it does warrant at least giving a call to your medical provider to ask by chance if you can get a 90 day supply of your medicines. And if you are in, uh, considering or you are in the process of a switch of your medical regimen at this time, please, uh, along with your care professional, your care team, monitor this very closely. And we can't say it enough. Additional cautions should be taken for people who are, who are living with advanced stage HIV or people who have poorly controlled HIV, as that leaves us very, very susceptible to advanced disease. Next slide. Okay, this is me playing mama, and if you're a part of any of the Thrive Networks, you understand how I get. But it's important, this practical advice for people living with HIV is important to, to keep lists of all of your medications, as well as the numbers and the contact information for your care team, as well as any com, uh, important emergency contacts, people who must be uh, made aware if you're ever hospitalized or anything like that. Not only put this information in your cell phone, which most of us have cell phones, also try to keep this information written in your wallet. So just in case your cell phone goes dead or by chance you're separated from your cell phone, we, this information is very, very important. Keep your list. Next slide. And in the case that we are hospitalized, as people living with HIV especially, make sure that the medical, that the professionals, the medical professionals do not discontinue your medications. Um, I've had to do this with myself, as well as my family members, having to advocate on their behalf after they've been admitted to the hospital and, you know, all of a sudden their ARVs are out the window because they have something, some a new emergent issue going on. It's important that we fight and advocate for our medications to be uh, continued regardless of whether we're in or out of the hospital. And this is especially important for people who receive the ibuluzumab uh, in, infusions every two weeks. These infusions are essential for people living with HIV. And if you're a person who receives these infusions, the number to their patient support is listed on the screen, please contact them to make sure that these medicines are continued. Next slide. In summary, precautions are important. Yeah, this COVID is happening to not only us, it's happening to all of us. And, you know, it's important that we, especially as people living with HIV, that we maintain our medical regimen, regardless of what during this time. Uh, services are available to you. Like I'm, I, we, everyone on this call essentially uh, hides out in public. We are available to help you at any point. And you, we, as people living with HIV, we are our own best health advocates. And it's important that we're ready and adept at advocating for ourselves. So next slide, a quick to-do list, actively seek support. Most aid service organizations and community-based organizations have 
taken their their virtualized their programming so engage these programming uh i know as jim was saying earlier the 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 the, the cabin fever may be getting to a lot of us if you're looking for something to do engage these virtual programming if you're a person living with hiv in the country regardless of where you are your demographic sexual orientation or any of that and you are looking for support thrive ss is here to link you to support regardless of uh where you are or how you identify create this and 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 fall in love with this new routine create your new routine what is your new normal as jim was saying earlier you know take that shower you know get get dolled up treat yourself well embody a new healthy sexy even routine and here's mama coming back out make your list again list your medic your medications list your care providers their numbers and also the numbers of all of your important must uh, know contacts your emergency contacts in case you're hospitalized but in addition make lists of goals during this time we have a lot of time on our hands and it's great to check certain things off the list and most importantly check in on one another <laughs> I can't say it enough, and we'll probably say it a lot, lot, lot uh, more during this conversation. We are stronger together. We need one another. I thank you all, and make your list. Better make your list. Wonderful, Larry. Thank you. Um, again, let's uh, take a minute and think about questions. We've got plenty of time. Uh, Damon at Morehouse is. Uh, fielding questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead, encourage everybody who's got questions to type in the chat box if you'll direct them to Austin or Jim or Larry. Um, Damon, I've, I've seen a couple questions for Dr. Chan. Why don't we go ahead and fire up a couple medical questions? Do you have some for us? Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Chan, we had one question about taste buds. So what about loss of taste? Is that a uh, indicator for COVID-19? Oh, sure, definitely. Um, you know, there's definitely been a lot of case reports in terms of loss of smell, um, loss of taste as it infects, you know, the kind of respiratory mucosa. It, it may um, cause some temporary loss of smell stuff. Um, you know, there's lots of case reports of lots of different symptoms. You know, some people reporting only having headache, uh, some people reporting you know, only having diarrhea. Um, you know, the, the science is, is evolving very, very quickly. You know, that being said, um, if you have if you have new onset symptoms and you can't necessarily trace them to anything, I mean, it, it's certainly worthwhile to see if you can get tested. In a perfect world, we would be testing literally everybody. Um, but if you are concerned, I think it's totally fine to reach out to your local testing center and see if you qualify for a test. Thank you for that. Another medical? Yes. Are clients currently taking um, ART drugs at a higher level of protection due to the fact that COVID-19 is viral? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. You know, we've seen some compounds that have some in vitro um, efficacy against COVID. You know, specifically, Kaletra was one that was in the news. But the reality is, I would assume no. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, and I would urge them to take the standard precautions. Um, as we heard Larry say, you know, I definitely would not be switching to a collegiate based regimen. Um, unfortunately, there's just no evidence to suggest that it has any efficacy or prophylactic value. Um, there's a lot of studies ongoing, you know, and we will definitely get some more information there. I think favaparavir and remdesivir are probably going to be our best antiviral agents. Um, but, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, the the nature of the virus it, it's fairly distinct from um the hiv virus thank you so much i'm going to suggest a couple for larry while you're doing that public service announcement if you're working from a, a work laptop i wouldn't try all of the websites that larry suggested just a heads up <laughs> yes please be, be, be discreet about which websites if you're on the company laptop all right absolutely what do you got for larry Larry, uh, how about if you live with your partner, is it safe to have sex if you live with your partner? If your partner is engaging in social distancing as well, I mean, I would, I would definitely uh, defer to Dr. Chan, but like if your partner is engaging in social distancing as well, y'all are isolating together. Yes, if, if your partner is 
for like maybe delivering the mail. I, I would think that that might be different. Or if your partner, you know, uh, by chance works in the airport or something like that, then that might be different. But like if you're in, in the same house with a person and you know their movements, then it should be safe uh, and less less risky to engage. Absolutely, and we'll definitely send out the New York uh, New York Health Department. New York Department of Health has released some guidelines surrounding sex, so we'll definitely be sure to send that that to all the participants as well. But Larry, thank you for that. Larry, we have another question. So many people living with HIV are working through this outbreak. I feel like this conversation is around those who are able to isolate and misses those who are forced to work. How do you support someone who feels like they're forced to risk their life to pay their bills? This could go for Jim or Larry, actually. Um, I'll start. Um, this is actually not a, a foreign concept to me. You know, our network, there are members of our networks who go to work every day on the front line. And the way that I support them is I listen to them. Uh, I am a person, of, uh, fortunately uh, for me, that I am a person who is able to telework and things of that nature, but understanding that everybody is not able to do that. And I would support them in the way that they want to. Sometimes that is just having a conversation and knowing that like I'm pulling for them and that I'm supporting, that I'm appreciative of them. I think that we should all, you know, we owe a debt of support and, and, and gratitude to the people who are still in the front lines, not just the medical professionals, but even the person that works at the grocery store, um, you know, and that we should be holding them up in the best ways possible, making sure that their minds and, and their hearts are in the right place um, and that they're not, you know, that, that they're better able and capable of mitigating and dealing with the stress and the anxiety that we're all feeling. I feel angst out and I haven't left my house in three weeks, so I can imagine if I worked at Kroger. So, thank you. I, so much. I just want to add. I think we all need to commit as we as we recommit to getting through this together. I think we all need to be our most generous selves, and that means recognizing that uh, because of the reality of people's lives who need to go to work to pay their rent to to do the thing and the risk that they take. Um, I, I've taken to thanking everybody I see who's still working, so that I can eat and get gasoline and the the things that that I'm doing, uh, uh, whether that's looking in on friends, uh, saying hi to strangers safely, uh, uh, helping people who are economically disenfranchised. Again, what we're dancing around here, and it's a whole other webinar, there are two Americas. There's an America where people are gonna get their health insurance paid and get a paycheck no matter what, and what, and there's, there's the America of people who are working class and, uh, people who are poor, and uh, again, it's beyond what we can do here. But but if you know people who are in that other America who aren't being paid to stay home, I think to to be grateful, to be gracious, and to do whatever you can to help lift them up, uh, and and at a minimum to be gracious during this time. Damon, more medical questions. I've seen several medical. Let's make Dr. Chan work for it. All right. Okay. Is it possible to acquire COVID-19 after having it once? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the million dollar question. Um, so in general, you know, with coronaviruses, we expect that once you have the disease, <clears throat> you develop convalescence, you know, um, met a fancy medical term for your, you're generally immune after the fact. Um, I've seen, you know, the science is evolving pretty rapidly. I've seen a couple case reports of of people specifically in South Korea and China who developed symptoms and tested positive um, after extended durations. Um, the short answer is hopefully not for most folks, um, but it certainly is a possibility. Um, so we'll just have to watch that very closely. And, you know, I'm sure whatever I say now will be contradicted in about a week. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. At the moment, uh, that the patient has symptoms, how many days after recovery is the end of isolation? Yeah, I would say um, in general, you know, five days if there's no more fever, uh, as Jim pointed out, or, you know, 14 days um, from the start of symptoms. You know, I would, these guidelines are constantly shifting, um, but generally, you know, generally that's, that's a good rule of thumb. That's certainly what we're, we're advising folks for, for our, uh, our area. All right, thank you for that. Okay. 
Should we pivot? We have a bunch of questions to all just general questions. Yeah, make make uh, Larry and I handle a couple as long as they're not virology questions. Okay, no problem. People are noticing small everyday activities that they usually take for granted. Will this COVID-19 change our society going forward? Huh. I'll start, Larry, then I want to know what you think. I don't know. I, I, I hope that it brings out the best in us and that we uh, stop to smell the roses. I mean, I've heard people say there's a silver lining and that we may be changed for the better. I, I have difficulty with that today just because I feel so much sadness about what's going on collectively and so much fear about where we'll be at the end that it's still really difficult for me to say, um, to see that silver line to say there, there'll be ways that we're better as people, as a culture. Um, I hope that's true, but, but it's hard for me to feel that. Larry? Yes. Um, so my my opt the optimistic larry would love to just go back to the day where you know i could just walk in a room and hug and kiss every person in the room i just the realist larry is feeling like that may be uh, different uh for the foreseeable future um i hope that we, we're able to go back to some symbol semblance of like normalcy at, at thrive we have over 200 events a year like most of our events have you know 50 plus people so we want to go back to normal but um what I do know and what I do feel is that the new normal will be something that we will work our ways through. You know, being a, a black gay man and a black person, a marginalized person in this country in general, I am very clear that, you know, we're very resilient and we're, uh, we have a nimbleness that, you know, uh, will put some others to shame. So um, I my answer is that I do think that things will be different, but I know that that different will be beautiful as well. Thank you so much for that. Definitely. Other questions? Yes. Can you provide tools to help someone that calls you crying and thinking that he or she has it and will die? You know, I, I, I think we're talking about the first step is just managing the emotion. So, so the way we do that is just to get people to try to do some containment. So let's take some deep breaths together. Let's go ahead and try to use your tone in your words to settle the situation down, to say, I'm here with you. I mean, again, what am I needing in that crisis? I'm needing to know I'm not alone. So I'm here with you. Uh, let's go ahead and try to calm this emotion. Let's go ahead and settle the tears down. If you, if you can get that emotion down, help me figure out why you think that, what symptoms are you having? You know, again, what strikes me is there is a fork in the road. Is this someone who's who's symptomatic, who has a lot going on? Is this someone who's just so overwhelmed uh, that that uh, uh, maybe they're they're manifesting physically something they're feeling emotionally? So to to provide some immediate emotional support to try to use your therapeutic skills to get someone settled down. Uh, to again, use your voice and your pace and say, I really want to understand. Can you speak more slowly? Hopefully to let those tears die down. Once you've done crying, help me explain what's going on. So once I get to talking about what's going on, I move out of my emotion and into my head. You can rationally assess the risk. And then at that point, um, you know, one of two things, either structure them towards their healthcare provider and getting information support around their healthcare needs or move into a different direction, which is just how to manage chronic anxiety. You know, to me, if it, 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 it's sort of that that fork or triage. This is someone who's just so anxious, they've worked themselves up into a thing, or this is someone who has so much going on medically that they really need to be seen medically and kind of triage. Once their emotion is settled down, explain what's going on, and then you kind of figure out, do I need to link them to medical care or do I need to talk them through ways that people who are anxious settle themselves down. There's some things in the slides about deep breathing and yoga and mindfulness, other strategies uh, for managing anxiety that would be things I'd share with that person. Thank you so much. I, okay, taking a pivot back. If someone has a lower CD4, but has a high CD4% ratio, would they be less at risk or equal 
to a person with a higher CD4 and higher, C and higher CD4 percent ratio. And if you need me to read it again, Dr. Chen, let me know. Oh, sure, Damon. Yeah. Um, you know, again, CD4 percent is a really, really good surrogate. You know, lots of folks feel like it's um, even better than absolute CD4 count. So, you know, what I would say is if you haven't necessarily been initiated on any uh, prophylactic medications for PJP or anything else based on your CD4 percent or CD4 count in addition to your viral suppression, um, you know, then I would, I would assume that you're probably at like, you know, average risk. I would take your other factors into consideration, but I wouldn't assume that you're at any increased risk of mortality, um, you know, based on this infection. Again, key thing here, you know, remaining virally suppressed. And obviously for those patients who do have lower CD4 numbers, you know, it, it's probably a sliding scale as you get lower, there's higher risk of mortality. But again, there's just not a ton of data available right now. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have a very important question. Um, we, we talked a lot about this. Is telehealth available to people without insurance and how is it assessed for people living with HIV? I know that here in Atlanta, um, some of the aid service organizations that provide Ryan White care are going to a telehealth uh, uh, platform. Um, so it does vary, uh, unfortunately, across the, the landscape. And it, 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 so it may vary in your area, but I know that there are providers in Atlanta who are at least stating that they have the capabilities and are doing telehealth meetings. And Lair, we received guidance, guys, from HRSA, and HRSA stated that continuity of care should continue. So all Ryan White funded clinics should be providing some uh, level of virtual telehealth, either by, by via phone, either a, a option via phone, uh, virtual via Zoom or WebEx or some type of FaceTime or something like that. But HRSA has released guidelines and we'll share those at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the call as well when we uh, send out the slides and other resources. But HRSA has provided um, guidance around that. So, guys, you sh if you are positive or you have clients that are positive and, and are on Ryan White, please, please, please empower them that they should be empowering their providers that they need to have some sort of care. You can do certi recertifications via the phone as well as ADAP certifications on the phone as well. So, nothing should stop. The continuity of care has been assured by HRSA. The um, the next question we have is, has there been any numbers or data on spouse, partner, or roommate abuse reported as a result of COVID-19? I'll take a step. I don't have the data, but I'm absolutely certain. I guess I've heard anecdotally that calls to uh, DV hotlines have increased. And so I don't have hard data, again, other than having heard reports that there's an increased call. I will go out on a limb having done a bunch of work in intimate partner violence and say, absolutely, if you've got people under stress in this kind of emotional hotbed who are locked up and there's a tendency towards violence, you're absolutely going to experience more violence and the usual ways of leaving getting out of the house, blowing off steam that are not available, uh, I will say at the end of the day, we will certainly see uh, numbers, hard data that says, here's what happened in terms of incidents of intimate partner violence and, and all kinds of violence, I mean, partner violence, uh, kid violence. You, you can't tell me that people who are used to spending four hours with their kids who are now spending 18 hours with their kids, um, some of those parents aren't losing their cool. Some of those parents who usually can keep it together for four hours aren't becoming violent with their kids. I would go out on a limb and say I'm certain there's been an increase in violence across the board. We don't know. I don't have hard numbers yet, but I feel it's very likely that when it's all done, uh, we'll, we'll know that that's happened. Thank you so much for that. And I can only imagine. Any information about people living with HIV and AIDS and being incarcerated uh, surrounding COVID? So is there any data or information around how people living with HIV are hand being uh, treated in prisons and or jails? 
Austin, I know you think about hepatitis C. If you had a guess about what's going on in jail, can you handle that one? Um, yeah, I, I really don't have a ton of information on uh, HIV and COVID and incarcerated populations, but I will say, you know, it does create COVID and incarcerated populations in general just create, you know, a really, really challenging situation in general. Um, you know, in New York Correctional Care Facility, you know, you already have overloaded prisons, overloaded jails, and then, you know, it's essentially almost impossible to, you know, social distance from people um, in those kinds of settings. And, uh, you know, so what you're seeing is a lot of, you know, mass releases of uh, people with non who are nonviolent offenders. I think that's definitely the right way to go. Um, and, you know, you see even the, the news stories coming out about aircraft carriers you know, military ships where there's lots of people in close quarters. Again, it's just incredibly challenging to, you know, practice effective social physical distancing, um, isolation in those settings. And so, you know, unfortunately they're they're at high risk for spread once they get into the system. Thank you so much for that for comparative analysis. How can we support the long term long time survivors among us? who in some cases are starting to encounter PSD, PTSD like feelings from the early days of the epidemic. You, have, you may have answered this before, but I had a small child clamoring for attention and may have missed it. <laughs> um, this, that's an amazing question. I'll take a stab at that first. Um, as we have a network full of uh, long-term survivors and, and, and it's crazy because we created the network because long-term survivors often deal with depression and related to isolation and feelings of, you know, uh, survivor's guilt and stuff like that. And for them, a lot of the, for th them, uh, this is bringing up a lot of those old feelings like Jen spoke to earlier. Um, what we're doing is that we're trying to spread, shine extra, send extra love and light to them. We're providing them with like uh, an abundance of things to engage uh, during this time so that they know that they're not by themselves. And then also making sure that, you know, as uh, I think Jim mentioned earlier, that we're fielding our, that we're linking them and referring them to, you know, people can, who can help them to deal with this emotional drain and this emotional strain at this time. I know that if you're in Atlanta, we have uh, several different uh, partnerships with uh, emotional wellness facilities that are still doing intakes and seeing new clients via telemedicine specifically around the subject understanding that people who lived through the the early hiv epidemic and may be experiencing this pandemic in a, a very traumatizing and re-traumatizing way yeah I, I i've been thinking about about factors that create resiliency in the face of trauma uh, that that i am going to i'm going to stand by my belief that we're living through some kind of freewheeling trauma and what you're saying is people who've experienced the early waves of hiv and i think for a lot of reasons for lots of people who are living with hiv there's been a lot of trauma in their experience so as larry said you know what we know about resiliency that is this traumatic event happened and about two-thirds of people didn't develop lasting symptoms a third developed ptsd as we look at what is going on for those two thirds of people, uh, social support, talking about what happened to people who are empathic, uh, you know, feeling all the feelings, being believed as they share the feelings, uh, purpose in life, uh, some kind of spiritual life. Uh, those factors uh, tend to be factors that promote resiliency in the face of trauma. So as we all kind of think about how we help one another, how we help people that we care about, and especially those folks who maybe have a trauma history because of the first wave of HIV. But I think it's also important to say, we know there's a disproportionate share of people with HIV who have, who bring a traumatic history to their diagnosis. And so just recognizing we're working with a lot of people who've survived trauma and as they face this trauma, kind of looking to support and expand those resiliency factors is what I would add. Thank you so much. Uh, what platforms are people using to maximize telehealth and telemedicine with relation to HIV care and prevention interventions? 
For example, peer support, adherence counseling, social media and marketing. How are folks getting COVID info to targeted populations to debunk myths? I'll start. I think a lot of people have been using Zoom and I know Zoom got a bad rap. Free Zoom had some security problems and so I think that's problematic. But uh, people that pay for Zoom, Zoom has been used pretty regularly because it's HIPAA compliant. And so of people that I know, and that's not a huge uh, universe, but of people I know, and I've got no financial investment, uh, people uh, are using the pay version of Zoom and have been. Again, other platforms are coming into HIPAA compliance, but that's an enormous question. Like if you start down that road because uh, we're all entities that have to maintain confidentiality, any platform that people choose has to be HIPAA compliant in order to provide any HIV services. Larry, do you know any other specific programs? Uh, I, uh, what I can say is everyone should have an AETC in their state. And all state AETCs have been tasked with providing technical assistance around this time. So for instance, we uh, were giving a Zoom license uh, where we were given an increase in our budget to purchase Zoom so that we can provide agency Zoom rooms to provide case management, adherence counseling, uh, uh, at home HIV testing and a number of other things. So reach out to your local AETCs in your area and they should have the same exact um, information and allowances to, to do some of that. Larry, anything else? Um, I will say this isn't related to the telemedicine piece. I know that my provider called me today related to that. Uh, it wasn't, he was willing, he's willing to actually have a conversation over the phone. So like some people are actually like actually conversing with their providers over the, to just the telephone. But as a great way to get information out to people living with HIV specifically about how COVID intersects with HIV is uh engaging support networks i know that i am the support networker i on this call right here but like there are tons of support networks for people living with hiv and other uh comorbidities that leave them high at high risk for covid and i think that getting the information into those spaces especially fact-based information not anything that's gonna like send everybody like into a frenzy but like making sure that uh, for our networks, we've been placing, uh, especially information coming from Black gay men, people who they can, they can identify specifically with who are in the medical profession or in this community realm, uh, making sure that they have access to that information because uh, rightfully so, people living with chronic ailments are freaking out right now. And a lot, there's a lot of opposing information and not all of it is factual, even the information coming out of the White House, unfortunately. So. I'll ask one more question, Jim. I know we're strapped with time, but I think this one is really important. And I think it's why we kind of have the call. What are some ideas for organizing locally to make sure that people living with HIV and AIDS who are in quarantine or self-isolation can access foods and medications? I'll start. I think, I think building on the existing uh, uh, network of services, I think, uh, as Damon said, there's an existing uh, service system uh, funded by Ryan White that's been instructed uh, to maintain those services. So uh, making sure that you are working within existing resources rather than creating new resources. I also think it's really important that we go back to the sort of old fashioned rural um, barn raising kind of idea where it's I've got eight people that I'm responsible for tracking and you've got eight people. You know, just just some real. I mean, I know in places like Boston and Los Angeles that that may be not as realistic. But if you think about your network and say, how are we how are we going to stay in touch within our network? I think there's a place, and this is from the mind of a social worker. I think there's a place for us to organize. Like I got a red team and a blue team and a green team, and and there's a captain of the red team. If anybody needs anything, they call that captain. And it, it involves us being creative and bringing some structure as opposed to just chatting, hey, girl, how you doing? Uh, but I, I do think that that by saying we're committed to one another, reaching out proactively, putting the burden on other people to say, hey, uh, again, we're kind of caring for a neighbor here who's for medical reasons, really hunkered down. And we're putting some, we, we want to help her and we're putting some burden on her. You tell us what you need. And so, so it's both creating systems and structures, again, working within the existing social service, HIV service delivery, ch challenging them to uh, step up if they're not doing all they should, 
but then it also involves some organizing and putting some onus back on uh, individuals we care about to say, hey, tell us what's going on. Well, Larry, would you add, like to add something before Jim uh, wraps up? And uh, thank you all for staying on the call. There's a lot of people that are still on the call. Thank you all so much. Uh, uh, that And you guys are giving us a lot of great feedback. Larry? That's the only thing I would add to that, I, I was basically snapping over here on mute when he was talking, you know, uh, the communalism, uh, it's, I think it's important, a piece that Jim did touch on is that it's important for people living with HIV, especially those of us who work in this space or who are more comfortable being active and engaging, um, to, to request that, you know, these aid service organizations still find a, figure out a workaround to make sure that the continuity of care actually happens. An example of that is uh, a few of my employees, um, the linkage manager, as well as a few of our members and members of the community came together to press on ADAP in Atlanta to make sure that pe people living with HIV, you know, had 90 days worth of medication. You know, that is the type of, that's what's gonna be needed in this time because the approach, the top down approach is so broken right now. We're gonna have to, it's on us to take care of each other. So if there are resources that, you know, that may be in your area, even put them in the chat, chat here so that we can know and propagate them in community because there's such a horrible uh like the effort is not coordinated enough to really like impact the people who are most vulnerable so pulling together banding together doing what jim said is uh, uh, related to communalism making sure that the people in your networks who are suffering right now know that you're there and that it's okay to ask for things and to express a need and feel safe enough to express that need but yes i i i agree I, wholeheartedly with Jim said. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, 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 and call time just because I know people have their commitments. Uh, let me wrap up. Austin, I said you were the smartest uh, infectious disease guy in uh, all of North America. I, I'm thinking it might be the world, but thank you, Austin, Larry, that, that was super. Everybody who's got unanswered questions, we're doing a follow-up in a couple weeks and, and that the questions that didn't get answered today, we're gonna roll over and also, there'll be a chance for you to advise us. We think this thing is moving so rapidly that our friends at Thera and the AATC are both thinking we'll revive, we'll do a, a, another version of this with some updates and specific to your questions and needs. So shout out to the people at uh, the um, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, shout out to Jim and Brandon at Thera Technologies for their super idea. Thanks to all of you for being part of this, taking time, uh, we've done questions. Uh, there you go. Way to, to reach out to our friends at Morehouse. Uh, those websites both uh, will give you a chance to talk about um, other needs. And, and again, part two of this webinar edition will be advised by the questions that didn't get answered there. If there are particular things you want to hear in two weeks, if you're interested, Positive Impact is still open. I know you are. Uh, uh, go ahead. I just saw a flash on the thing. PIHC positive impact is still open. Uh, go ahead and and write to the um, J Georgia ATC at at Morehouse uh, with your uh, input. Uh, that input today's unanswered questions will give us a chance. Um, I, again, thanks to everybody who made time. Uh, excellent questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to all of those. As I said, we'll try to factor those in. Uh, take care of uh, yourselves first. Uh, take care of one another and uh let's uh, get through this together we are stronger together with that we will uh close today's webinar wishing everybody well um and last thing do not forget to complete your evaluations for everyone that completes their evaluations we will be doing a raffle for a 50 dollars amazon gift card we will do this by uh we will determine this by the evaluation completions we'll do a raffle a virtual raffle and we'll send the virtual gift card to the winner so please complete your evaluations. The link is here, and it should also be in your participant dashboard. Thank you so much.